Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and I am joined today by William F. Ludwig III. Bill, how are you? Good, Bart. How's it going? Good. Thank you so much for being here. I can't tell you how excited I am. I feel like I'm talking to, uh, to drum royalty here. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you having me, and hello to all your listeners out there. hope everybody had a great holiday. Awesome. Why don't we just go ahead and, uh, without further ado, hop into the history of Ludwig and run through that, and then we'll end up with what you're doing today, which is WFL3 drums, which uh, are, from what I've heard, amazing, and I'm excited to try them out here um, in the next couple months. Um, And then we're going to finish up with some listener-submitted questions, which is a new kind of uh, subject we're doing on drum history, so I think that'll be a lot of fun. Great. Awesome. Good. Perfect. So I'll let you take it away. So how did it all begin? My grandfather was uh, a percussionist in playing drums in the circus. And uh, even to back up further than that, when his parents moved to the United States from Germany, his father was a violinist and his mother was a singer. And his father wanted him to play violin. And he was adamant about after seeing a parade and the drummers. He said, I want to be a drummer. And I'm so thankful for that because I I wouldn't be good at violin. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just can't see me with a violin. No. But and nothing against violinists. I'm sorry. But at any rate, uh, so he, he played drums for the circus and uh, as a touring drummer, and there were horse-drawn carriages at the time. That's how long ago it was. And during the off-season, which was the winter, he ended up in Chicago getting a, a gig with a vaudeville act. And being that the music was more up-tempo, the bass drum pedal he had just wasn't cutting it. And and we have one of his bass, original bass drum pedals, which was, I don't know, maybe 16 inches long wood footboard with a, a huge 14 or 16 inch high beater, all wood, very slow, very clumsy, and not portable. So he developed his own bass drum pedal in his garage and all of a sudden started using that at gigs and it was small, folded up, went in your pocket and people were just freaking out going, where did you get that? Well, I made it. Well, well, make me one. So that's how he started. And then his brother Theobald was a a drummer also and they together uh, grew from the garage to an actual uh, little drum shop mainly doing drum repairs and uh, helping people fix strainers and little things like that and making bass drum pedals. So that's how it all started. And then he got another gig down the road uh, with an opera and playing timpani. And they were hand-tuned timpani at the time, which he thought, boy, this is a drag. I wish I could do this with my feet. And he developed the foot-tuned timpani, which is still you know, one of the best uh, action, uh, foot-tuned actions out there now. And he just made things for himself uh, out of necessity, and then eventually other drummers would come to him and, and tell that tell him what they needed, which is how it grew into the sound effects you were mentioning earlier. Uh, the drummers, there's like two or three drummers at a silent movie behind the screen playing all the sound effects to go along with the movie that they're watching from behind. So the train goes by, they make a train sound. A boat goes by, they do a boat whistle. And all these drummers were coming to my grandfather going, you know, I need this, I need that. And so he started making them. And pretty soon he had, I don't know, I think five or six pages of the catalog devoted to the sound effects. And uh, all, you know, three different levels of boat whistles. Uh, three different kinds of train whistles and gunshot machine and rooster crow and duck call and all these crazy things to go with the silent movies. And that was, uh, to me, that that was just interesting and uh, fun to see and work with some of those, those items. Yeah, those are, um, I, I talked about it in the first episode, but it's just amazing how real they sounded and how much thought was put into each one to sound like a horse and to sound like the train. And they're beautiful handcrafted uh, instruments. Yes, yes. And, it's, and as you said, the, how did you come up with an idea of 
I need something to sound like a train going by. And it's just unbelievable how he came up with those things. And they still work today. Yeah. I mean, I use them. I, I do a history of percussion clinic, and I use them from the 1930s still. Got so it. that that's interesting to me. Yeah, they don't they don't make them like they used to, I guess, because I mean, <laughs> exactly. st- stuff doesn't yeah. last that long. Yeah. So yeah, so after the that that period in the in the twenties, um, yeah, why don't you pick it up from there? What's going on at that time? Well, that, that that's really an interesting question because uh, to skip ahead and then I'll go back to that. I was working uh, at Ludwig from Company with my father in my early twenties or I guess mid twenties, and they came out with the Lynn drum machine. Yeah. And I went into my dad's office and I said, oh, my God, this is awful. They've got this computer to do drumming now for studio work. And all these drummers are going to be out of work and it's going to crush us. And he said, well, no, it, it won't. It happened before and it'll come, it'll change and everything will swing back to regular acoustic drums. I said, what do you mean it happened before? Well, apparently when they came out with talking movies, every drummer was out of work the next day. Because the theater owners were just like, oh, no, we don't need you. We have talking movies now. So my grandfather panicked. And along with the uh, depression, looming depression, and talking movies, my grandfather sold the business to Khan, who at the time owned Leedy Drum Company. And they wanted to team up. Their theory was if they teamed up Ludwig with Leedy, it would help boost the leady sales or their drum sales in general. And uh, so he went ahead and sold to them and started working for them. And they were in Elkhart, Indiana. And he, over the years, a couple of years, he didn't, wasn't getting along with them. They weren't doing new product development the way he thought it should be done. Uh, they weren't doing a lot of things the way he thought it should be done. So that's what triggered him to say, I'm out of here. I'm going back to Chicago and starting my own drum company again. And their response to that was, well, that's nice, but we own your name. And he said, fine, I'll use my initials. So that's how WFL Drum Company came about. And he was very uh, smart to put very small underneath the logo, William F. Ludwig, president. So yeah. everybody immediately knew, oh, Ludwig. And they associated the Ludwig name and products with quality and good customer service. So that's how he rebuilt the company in, in those early days uh, to what it became as the largest, most famous name on drums. Yeah, that's fascinating because I know with uh... – what I've heard from Khan is that they just didn't really care. They wanted to make money off of Ludwig and Leedy. Right. And as Rob Cook said, they just called it the, uh, the sawdust factory. They didn't refer, they didn't care about it. It just, it wasn't anything. So, um, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and that, that type of, uh, accounting mentality numbers only, you know, trickles down to the product, to the image of the company and the way customers are treated and, you know, the music business is different. Musicians uh, are, are a different breed than somebody buying a car or some other item. You know, it's just, uh, yeah, it has to be treated differently. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's just something special. And people, there's, there's other drum companies you can buy. So I know um, I'm personally really brand loyal and I feel a connection. My first real drum set was Ludwig. So I feel a connection to Ludwig. And I think, I think a lot of people do. It just has this gives you a, a certain kind of feeling. Yeah. Well, we did We did when it was family-owned. Yeah. And I'll just leave it at that. That whole con percussion division was going down, and they weren't doing a lot to keep it alive. So WFL Drum Company just started to take off. And, uh, you know, as I said, people were people knew it was my grandfather, so that got a lot of attention and a lot of, drummers coming back to him and they you know he started in a small 
rented shop in Chicago and all of a sudden grew to another floor of the building and all of a sudden bought the building. And next thing you know, we were, you know, just expanding like in leaps and bounds. It was unbelievable. God, that's so awesome. We finally occupied the whole city block. Wow. But, uh, yeah. So to start like that, to start over in a basement type uh, rental shop with money borrowed from his friends and his wife and, you know, anybody he could just to get going to become the biggest drum company in the world is pretty amazing. It is. I mean, that's just a, uh, it's kind of the underdog story. Um, so, yeah. how, so how did he get the name back? Why don't we pick it up there? Well, in 1955, I believe uh, uh, the Khan company had just officially shut down all percussion manufacturing a, a little before 1955. And then in 1955, my, my father, I was born, and my father thought, well, you know what, if we could get our name back and go back to Ludwig Drum Company, then that would just cement our future. So dad went ahead and had a meeting with uh, Khan and bought the name back. Hmm. And then with, at the time we were, you know, really expanding and I think we bought Musser, a uh, mallet company, and then uh, a case company. So we changed it from Ludwig Drum Company to Ludwig Industries, just as the you know, main company with divisions under it. Yeah, the kind of parent company. I didn't know that. I didn't know you had a, yeah. a case company. I knew about Muster, but not the uh, the cases. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we bought a case company, uh, Schuschler. Okay. It was called SCH Schuschler. They were a Chicago-based company, and we bought them and moved them into, our, into another uh, shop we had and took their employees, so we kept the same quality and same manufacturing processes and and so then we were full service we made our we were the only company that made our own hardware shells sticks heads cases everything was made on damon avenue the only thing that wasn't done there was the chrome plating wow one-stop shop that was my grandfather's uh, you know the the german mentality of to do something right do it yourself yeah and uh, that way we can control our quality and keep an eye on everything. So now we're about the mid-50s, and you have got the name back, so everything is going great. Um, it, they're now Ludwig Drums. There's some subsidiary companies um, like the Cases and Musser Percussion Instruments. So then we get into the 1960s, which uh, obviously was a massive time of change in uh in music across the world. Yes, and at the time, you know, we were we had quite a few of the top jazz artists around and knew that the, the power of endorsements uh, was so strong. So when rock and roll started to evolve, we were going after that market. And then, uh, you know, the next thing you know, that small band from England, uh, hit the Ed Sullivan show, what was her name? The, uh, <laughs> the Beatles. Yeah, some of the Beatles. And, yeah, and Ringo, you know, saw this new finish we had and Black Oyster Pearl and said, oh, I've got to have that. And the word was only Ludwig made that. And he said, well, I want to play an American-made product anyhow. And uh, so he bought his first Black Oyster kit, and the next thing you know, they were on Ed Sullivan. Man, and then everything changes from there. Oh, the next day. The next day it changed. I mean, it was, I was in fourth grade, sitting on mom and dad's living room floor watching the, the show, and I thought, wow, our name keeps popping up everywhere. <laughs> I mean, every shot of, of John or Paul or George, and it had the Ludwig logo behind him, you know. And, and God. it was just out of... So the next day, our phones were ringing off the hook, the customer service phones, where everybody, all the dealers saying, and customers saying, you know, I want to buy a Ringo kit. And, and the customer service people are saying, what's a Ringo kit? <laughs> and my father's like, just shut up and write the order. Just write their name down, you know. And, oh, my God. Uh, oh, it was... And then, then we grew to... Uh, the demand was so high, we went to 24 hours a day, 
six days a week. Oh, my God. Wow. And that is cranking a lot of drums out the door at that point. I mean, you know, 24-hour production, and we were still like nine months behind on the Black Oyster Pearl. My God, wow. What did one of those drum? what did one, like, cost at that point? Do you remember? No, I think I'd say around seven hundred, eight hundred dollars. Yeah, that's about. I mean, at that point, two cymbal stands and two cymbal stands and a hi hat and a bass drum pedal and and the drums. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, the 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 image of you sitting there and your family. I mean, was it just like? I guess at the moment you're watching it, you didn't really realize how huge that is until the next day when when you're just no, it's just going crazy. I had no idea, and then I really had no idea until Dad came home that night and said, "Wow, we got a lot of orders for that Ringo from that you know Ringo guy, Black Oyster Pearl." And I thought, okay, that's cool, and I still didn't really, you know I was in fourth grade, I didn't think about it that much, but but wow. I was actually uh, started working in the factory shortly after that, and uh, I think it was in the fourth grade fourth grade year. And Dad said, you know, why don't you come down on Saturdays and and, uh, open mail and, you know, after. So I would open this huge pile of mail and stamp it received with the date and then put, you know, try to separate them from customer to dealer piles. And when I was done with that, my pay was I got to play with the switchboard, which at the time was the old fashioned with the cords that came out and you plugged in and yeah. all the lights and switches and the headset. And I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. That's funny. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> so that's cool. I grew up, I literally grew up in the factory and then, uh, you know, I'd go down and play in the factory and then eventually started working there every summer in different departments and, uh, loved it. Obviously, Ludwig had been around for 50-plus years at that point, 1909 going to about 1965. But that is the – I mean, would you consider that the pivotal breakthrough moment to just go worldwide massive? Everyone knows Ludwig. Well, we were already worldwide, and we were already quite big. But that just took us to a whole other area. I mean, just – it was – like a rocket taken off. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And, you know, all of a sudden, uh, all of our displays at conventions doubled in size. And, and yeah. you know, we had to get more staff and more salespeople and uh, larger warehousing facilities for raw materials. And it was, it was just unbelievable. And when we did build the new factory, the new addition after Ringo, uh, I'll never forget Dad had the blueprint spread out again on the living room floor and bought a, a toy semi-truck hmm. and said to me, here, play with this and take it in and out of that entrance and then out the other side to make sure you can turn that corner and make sure it fits. <laughs> and uh, so that's how we built the factory, so we could pull a semi completely indoors out of the weather and unload everything, check the inventory, and then the semi would continue out the other door and on its way. Man. And it was really a slick situation because, you know, dealing with wood and uh, the pearl wraps and things like that, you you don't want to be taking that out of a semi in a snowstorm. No. And uh, and or rain. So that that was just perfect. Wow. And are you in, uh, were you in, Elkhart in this point in Indiana, or were you guys back oh, no. in Chicago? Oh, no. When my grandfather left Con, he left Elkhart and back to Chicago. Yeah, it seems like there's some and, bad bad feelings towards Elkhart from uh, some drummers <laughs> who were forced to go oh, there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's another story. But, yeah. The, uh, but, yeah, my grandfather started, restarted uh, on Damon, not far from Damon Avenue, and then I think he moved a couple of blocks over to Damon Avenue when he started to expand and was at that address, 1728 North Damon for, uh, you know, since the the early or late forties, I guess, or mid forties. Hmm. Wow. And that's where I grew up basically, you know, and as, and it was funny as we added, as we grew, 
we would take over a building next to us or build a build another building and then attach them all with uh, walkways and uh, covered uh, hallways that would fit a, a forklift up and down it. But they were all different heights and different ages, and so you'd walk through one part of the building and it's kind of leaning to the right, and then the next building is leaning a little to the left. But <laughs> That's awesome. But, but it was our place, and it's... Uh, it was quite a place to grow up. Yeah, I mean, you are a uh, you're one lucky guy to be to be in that family. And I mean, obviously, I'm sure it wasn't with all of the the sales and up and down of people buying the company and the name and losing the name and getting the name. I'm sure it's not it's not all uh, you know Ringo on the Ed Sullivan show. And and there was a, there was a whole you know whole unbelievable roster of endorsers that supported us. Uh, in jazz and rock, you know, Joe Morello, yeah. uh, Buddy Rich was with us a few times here, came and went, Yeah, uh, you know, Ray the Duke, Roy Haynes, Max Roach, and then the rock guys came into it, Carmine with Vanilla Fudge, and uh, John Bonham with Zeppelin, and Ginger Baker, and it was just unbelievable. Yeah, the the... I just when when people think of classic drums, like I was saying before, I think it's Ludwig, and it's not just Ringo. Like you just said, there's a huge roster of people. Like I just yeah. on my social media stuff posted a video of Alex Van Halen, who's another longtime Ludwig guy. Sure. So it's just uh, sure. it's it's just so cool. So picking it up after Ringo, which is kind of the major, you know, the the peak, the top of the mountain there. Um, what happened after that? Was it all smooth sailing for a little while? I mean, you get you get into Zeppelin right after that with Bonham, who is obviously many drummers' favorite, you know, favorite guy. So yeah, what was it like after that? Well, it was it was still busy, you know, and and it, there was struggles though. I mean, with with that much uh, increase in pr- production, you've got to watch the quality. You know, we had a few glitches with quality, but. Uh, you know, those are just normal business problems that pop up, and uh, but but we grew, continued to grow. Uh, another one of our great endorsers was Roger Pope, playing with Elton John, who was doing some incredibly big shows at that time, and uh, it was just uh, exciting. It was yeah. just a lot of fun and a lot of excitement and a lot of work. I worked couple of summers in customer service and uh boy the phones just never stopped and looking back on those times now i just chuckle because there was no computers no you know voice messages or answering machines so you had to just get somebody on the phone looking for an order and then you had to go out and find the order while they were on hold you know Mm. and, and it was quite interesting i mean nowadays with computers and everything like that it would have been a lot simpler, but yeah, we made it work. Yeah, really. Now you can just get on and order a Ludwig drum set from probably five hundred different websites, and it you know comes from yeah. a different store. Or this and that. That's uh, yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. And so the same with same with managing your inventory control. I mean, it would be so much simpler with a, a computer than a guy walking through a department once a week counting how many fourteen inch shells we had left. Yeah, you know. And uh, better get that count right, or we're going to be in trouble next week. Yeah, a lot of room for error, obviously, which is kind of eliminated oh, yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but I enjoyed it. I as as I said, I then during summers, I, another job I had was Dad sent me on the road with a couple of our salesmen hmm. for like two three weeks at a time, and uh, I would ride with them. Ludwig had its own dedicated sales force, which was huge. Yeah. And uh, going to a dealer's store, and I would just observe, and I'd be writing the order as the salesman did the talking. And I learned an awful lot during those times. And uh, that was a lot of fun, though, too. Now, I got to ask, did you use the uh, the famous, like, the salesman, or what, I forget the actual name, but the finish that has the kind of rows of different Ludwig finishes on it. Would they take that around with them and say, hey, here's our sparkle finishes and here's all that? Well, that was a little before my time, before I did that. Hmm. At the, by the time I, I got involved in it, we they had real nice, uh, like, 
three inch by two inch rectangles of each finish on a keychain. Oh, cool. And you just keep that in your briefcase and just put that out and say, you know, here, here's what we have now. A uh, little, little easier to carry that around. I always, I love that. I know people, yeah. the, the black keys drummer plays that finish, um, or used to oh, at least. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, that's, yeah, that, that was uh, an interesting time. And then when we came out with Vista Light, you know, that was another big uh, addition to the line and uh, manufacturing challenges. Yeah, but, I'm sure. Uh, now, were you guys the first? I know Fibes had the acrylic stuff going on around that time. Were you the first acrylic drum maker, or was someone before you? Well, I'd say Fibes was before us, and I think uh, there might have been a couple of custom shops, but I, I'm pretty sure we were the first to do colored hmm. uh, plastics. And then, because my father, we were, both of us were always taking people on a tour of the factory, and my dad would go through the Vista Light department and see, he'd be talking to people and, and looking at this pile of scraps and go, man, it'd be great if we could use that somehow. And that's when he came up with the idea, told the engineers, let's glue a couple of these pieces together and make a two colored shell. Oh yeah. Cool. In a swirl. In yeah. A, in a swirl. So our engineering department came up with, that was the other cool thing about Ludwig is we had our own engineering department which was huge Yeah, to be able to go in and sit with a couple of guys or I'd bring an endorser or his drum tech in and say, he keeps breaking his hi-hat pedal, you know, show him where it breaks. And then they'd work on it and come out with a, a fix for that. But the engineers developed the plastic molding or welding. I mean, so it, instead of glue, it, it actually this whatever material they came up with melted both seams of the plastic. So it was like welding steel, and and it never, you know, the drums that we did have break never failed on the seam. It was always, you know, either somebody dropped it on a lug or somebody dropped something on the shell and it cracked somewhere else, but never on the seam, which that just blew my mind. Yeah, I mean, it's an unbelievable there's a Ludwig engineering department. And a lot of those drums have held up. Like, you see beautiful Vista oh, yeah. lights to this day, and it's usually like you said, user error, where they got dropped or something like that. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, as, as time went on, uh, I finally uh, got in the company full-time after college and uh, started doing uh, advertising for the company, the catalogs and posters and flyers and things. And then two weeks into that job, which is not what I studied in college, I studied industrial management and uh, industrial psychology to go into running the factory. That's yeah, you, what I thought I would be doing. You knew what you were going to, like, that's kind of nice you went to college with a, uh, hey, I know what I'm going to be doing. I just need to get the right knowledge to perform that. Yeah, right. And so I get out of college and dad says, oh, I just fired the advertising manager. You're going to do that. <laughs> and my jaw just hit the floor and I said, but, 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 I didn't study that. <laughs> well, you'll learn. Yeah. So he, throws, he takes me back to the advertising department with three people in it, all season, you know, pros. And, you know, here's your new boss, me, right out of college. I'm like, hi. <laughs> and, and they said, you know, have you ever done a layup for an ad? No. Oh, God. You know, yeah. So they're showing me things bit by bit, and I'm starting to trying to get a grip on it. And like two weeks into that, dad walks back to my cubicle and says, Oh, I just fired the artist relations manager. You're going to do that too. <laughs> At the and, same and time. Like, wow. Yeah. And, and I, that's kind of what I said in more or less different vocabulary, but I'm like, <laughs> but I haven't even learned this job. And I'll never forget my father walking out of the department, waving over his shoulder not turning around or anything, and just says, you'll learn. God, he trusts you, that's <laughs> and, for sure. Well, and, and luckily, you know, I was a drummer. I'd been a drummer since age six and uh, played in some rock bands in high school and college. And so I knew what drummers needed. I knew, you know, what was going on with, with the rock and roll world. So that that luckily put me in a good position to get to know all the artists right away, say, you know, uh, 
after watching you play, why don't you try this stand or why don't you try these heads and making the proper recommendations and everybody grew to trust me and appreciate that input. So we all of a sudden our, our artists became very uh, loyal and dedicated and friends, personal friends of mine and my father's. And again, going back to the time, there were no cell phones, no uh, texting, no computers. So everybody had my home phone number. So anything comes up, you know, on the road, call me anytime, 24 seven. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of times things came up where if I couldn't get a dealer, local dealer to get the guy, his parts or girl, uh, I would fly out. Wow. I'd uh, get the part. Oh uh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Fly to the gig. Uh, no luggage, just fly to the gig, rent a car, deliver the part, spend the night, fly home the next day. In fact, if we have time, there was a pretty funny story talking about this delights. Uh, Michael DeRocher was playing with Hart, hmm. yeah. and they were opening for Electric Light Orchestra on their big stadium tour, indoor stadiums. And they had, you know, their 60-foot round flying saucers, the stage, and it was very, very uh, big production. So he played the John Bonham style kit, but white Vistalite. So about 10 o'clock in the morning, I get a call from his drum tech. They dropped the, they were loading the bass drum on the stage on a forklift and it slipped off and fell. I don't know how many feet, 40 feet or something. Oh my God. And shattered and shattered, not just cracked, shattered. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, what? I said, what time do you go on? And he said, we go on at seven. I said, I'll see you before 7. <laughs> and, and I call my guy in the shop, Felix, who was my endorser, right-hand man, said, Felix, drop what you're doing and make a 26-inch white pistol light for Mike DeRocher right now. And he goes, but, but what about, you know, this order or the Zeppelin order or that order? I'm like, just just get this order done right now. Oh, my God. That and day? It phone. was the same day yeah. thing? Wow. Yeah, and they were playing at the Pontiac Silverdome outside of uh, Detroit. <laughs> so next thing, I call the airline, book myself a flight to Detroit, call my father and said, you know, in a couple hours, can you give me a ride to the airport? Sure. So I I go out and help him pack the Vistalite bass drum, which was still warm. <laughs> and uh, Dad takes me to the airport. I get out there. I had to rent a station wagon because it's the only thing that a 26 would fit in. <laughs> And now I'm in rush hour traffic, creeping up the freeway to, to, to the gig, and I get there like at 6.15, you know, or so, and every backstage person knew I was coming and just kept pointing me to the back. And I get the right to the back door, and there's two golf carts. <laughs> they throw the bass drum in one golf cart, take it to this, because this, you know, Pontiac Silverdome's 70,000 people. Yeah. And uh, so they take the bass drum in one golf cart, put me in the other golf cart, take me to the dressing room. And I walked in, and the band just went, yeah! <laughs> and it erupted. Oh, my Landed God. And the beer said, thank you, you saved us, oh, my God. Wow. And uh, so they gave me a hotel key. I spent the night and flew home the next day in the That's... same clothes. Unbelievable! I mean, wow! Talk I about. I didn't have time to pack. I, I didn't have time to get a toothbrush. God, you know? customer service right there, man. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh yeah. God, I can't and believe they you all knew it. I can't believe you turned it around that day. I mean, you could just say, "I need a oh, Vistalite yeah. right now." I mean, I guess they don't take yeah. week, weeks to make, but wow, that is awesome. No, no, but it takes hour, a couple hours, and you know the clock was ticking, so. Yeah, on a on a not standard. I mean, how many twenty six inch Vistalite bass drums are being made? That's exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. So that was uh, that was a challenge. But uh, so what year was so, what year I was did, that? I did a lot of those. That was probably seventy six, seventy six, seventy seven. So getting back in the the timeline here. So we're approaching when there was another sale of the business. Then correct, kind of in the early eighties. Yes, it was uh, November fifth, nineteen eighty-one. Not that I remember, but uh, <laughs> and, and oddly enough, that was to a company in Elkhart, Indiana. Oh God, old Elkhart. <laughs> the Selmer, the Selmer company, and uh, 
Yeah. So that that started that again, and when that happened, Dad and I uh, were had an agreement to work for them for five years, and Dad and I both stayed ten years because of our love for the company, and uh, they were starting to rub us the wrong way with their lack, you know, lack of engineering, lack of new product development, lack of artist support. So after 10 years, which was 1991, uh, they parted company with me. Hmm. And, uh, yeah. and that was, that was, uh, that was the end of my life in the drum business, which was uh, a huge uh, loss to me. And but it just wasn't the same anymore. I mean, it wasn't the family feel. They were all corporate, and I went on my way. I went into another business. I got involved in the restaurant business for a while, and then I did some. After I discovered that was uh, brutal. Yeah. I, I uh, did some various uh, office jobs, office uh, management jobs, you know, things that I didn't like, but I had two young daughters at the time. And yeah, you got to gotta do what you got to do. Pay the bills. Yeah. Yeah. So then finally, uh, that was uh, five years ago, I, I moved out to the Burbs so my daughters could go to a good high school because we lived in downtown Chicago. And it was just unbelievable to, you know, move into a, a place, putting up pictures. And I have this picture of my grandfather in the kitchen. And I kept looking at the picture. And he, he looked so proud and he looked so happy because he's in the factory testing a drum. So for some reason, five years ago, I took that picture off the wall. And in the back, in my father's handwriting... It's a senior starting over, age 63, 1940. Huh. Oh my and God. I was coming up, I was 59 at the time, and I thought, God damn it, if he can do it, I can do it. Yeah. So, uh, excuse me. Sure. So, uh, that's what pushed me over the edge to start WFL3 Drums. Yes, which is where we're at today. Yeah. Yes. And I couldn't be happier, I'll tell you, because uh, this is what I love doing. And, you know, my grandfather started over. He was actually 58 or 59 when he first got back to Chicago. So the picture I have is a couple of years after they got into production. But he lived to be 93 and was in the factory every day up until two weeks before he died. Oh my God! So he's ninety, because, ninety-three years old in the drum factory. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, and you know, smoking his cigars out in the <laughs> shop, picking up quality mistakes. You know, bitching at people. They <laughs> hurry up, and oh yeah, he was. But he was doing what he loved. Yeah. And uh, I thought, you know, that's what I want to do. So now I'm age sixty-three. My drum business is starting to grow. Yeah. We just introduced full drum kits uh, last summer. So at the NAM show in a couple of weeks, we're going to be showing full drum kits. And uh, made in the USA, I have, we have a factory outside of Kansas City. So I'm just uh, ecstatic with the way that this has worked out. Well, they are beautiful drums, and you can tell that they're made in the classic drum making fashion but they're modern you have all of the nice modern touches that we we've kind of that you personally have learned over the years of being in the ludwig family so you're kind of getting the best of both yeah. worlds thank you thank you very much that's what i set out to do when i first started which was with a, with snare drums which is the you know starting point i thought but i wanted to get that old classic uh Superphonic 400 sound, and uh, and so we have a metal shell, aluminum metal, and three ply wood, which is a thin wall shell with a, a support rings inside, the way Senior made them. And both those snare drums just sound phenomenal. And getting rave reviews from 
people who are using them live and in the studio. And uh, then the next natural progression was the kits, which are the same uh, thin wall wood shell that the snare drums are. And they just sound phenomenal. Everybody that plays the kits jumps up after five seconds and goes, oh, my God, the classic sound. Yeah. The w- word has spread. I've, I've heard people talking about them and saying that they're unbelievable. Oh, yeah? and, and it's just, yeah. Oh. So people, I think people know, and, and jumping back here, it's in, in what I'm seeing, in a weird turn of events, I don't know much about it, but Khan ended up buying Selmer. Is that right? Yes. Like, yes. what? You, Khan just can't move on I guess. still i know and now the whole thing is owned by steinway piano company wow yeah about four or five years ago steinway came over and bought the the con company which came along with selmer ludwig everybody else and uh three years ago a real estate developer person that's worth 11 billion dollars with a b oh my God. bought steinway yeah, I saw that name, too, and it, I was wondering how that person got involved. Well, he wanted Steinway for some reason. I don't know if he needed pianos for his mansions or what, but <laughs> uh, but he's not paying a whole heck of a lot of attention to the rest of the instrument divisions. He just focused on Steinway. So he God. got it, and he, that's that's where it stands today, and, and I'm so happy to be doing what I'm doing and not in that corporate venue of you know everything's numbers everything's uh, computer and everything's got to be this way so i'm just really happy and and with our own shop now which we've only had for a year it's so great i go down there on occasion and uh, my business partner lives down there and, and operates that end of it but i get to go in the factory again and play and say hey what if we tried this hey Let's try that. And if, yeah, you're back to the you old know, days. It, yeah, and I'm loving it. Man, for me, it's a big thing that people are supporting the guy, a, a true Ludwig. And it's just so funny that, and I love how you call it WFL three drums. In to yeah. me, it it obviously resembles the 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 separation of your grandfather going out on his own, and um, I mean, it just it's starting over. There's no better way to yeah. put it. That's just perfect. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And my, my tagline for the company is the sound of generations. Love it. Which which I think I think's very fitting. And I didn't do this on purpose, but last spring uh, I saw, I have a new endorser now, Kofi Baker. And uh, he is a fine, fine percussionist. And he got, uh, I, I don't know, I think it was about a year ago or so, he got Jack Bruce's son, and Eric Clapton's nephew together and said, why don't we do a tour for the 50th anniversary of Cream's last performance? Cool. So they did a tour and on WFL three drums, and uh, it doesn't get more generational than that. No. Bill Ludwig, Bill Ludwig the third working with Kofi Baker. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It was a great, it was a great tour. So I want to tell people before we move on. I want I want to get to the questions that people have submitted. But um, people can find you at wfl3drums.com. That's wfliiidrums.com. Roman numeral correct three. Yeah. So um, correct. And you can see pictures. You can see everything that Bill has available. Um, and you can get in touch with them and see the endorsers and all that cool stuff. So. Um, Really cool. Congratulations on on Thank you. starting over. Yeah. So Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, starting over at 63. <laughs> absolutely. It's never too late. So, yeah. as I said before, I had some questions submitted by a few folks um, from Instagram, um, where if, if people, I'm assuming most people are finding me through Instagram, because that's where I post a lot of uh, cool drum videos. But um, if you're not, you can go there and see a lot of cool videos. And I open it up for people to submit questions there. So I will start out with a gentleman who has become a friend of mine named Nate Testa, who wanted to ask, um, what did you learn while sitting behind the scenes watching what happened in your family with the company switching around. What have you taken from that and used in your current situation? Kind of like, what, what is your knowledge? What are, what are your watch outs that you're, you're being careful of? Well, 
you know, as I mentioned earlier, my I was brought up by my grandfather and father to have a quality product and top customer service, and you can't go wrong. So I walked away with that uh, very strong feeling, and and know it myself from life. If I go buy something, I want I expect customer service, you know, and quality, and that's one thing that's. Um, it drives me mad when I call somebody at the phone company or cable company and they push one for this guy, push two for this, push three for that. Why can't I just talk to somebody? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you call WFL three drums and I answer the phone. So it sounds like it's just all about customer service. I think that's just your entire yeah. family has been customer service top to bottom. Yeah. So that's... Right. um right. That, again, is from uh, Nate Testa, who I want to say actually has a – he's on social media as the official snare geek. Um, so I think oh. he can, he'll probably feature some WFL3 snares on there, and he, he does really cool uh, reviews and all this kind of stuff. Um, so Well, Nate, be, feel free to call me or send me an email anytime. Well, I'll, I'll tell Nate that after we get off the phone yeah. here today. So, um, yeah. cool. The next question I have is actually, an in- it's interesting because it's from a another friend of mine, and he's actually on the show. His name is Vincent Leaf, and he runs Vitalizer Drums. I don't know if you've heard of him. You'll get a kick out of this. His business, his job, updating and repairing and modernizing, for lack of a better term, um, Speed King pedals. Oh. Vincent's question was, uh, we kind of talked about it, but if you can... Briefly give us a little picture of this. He said, what was the factory like in the 60s and 70s? Uh, let's see. How do I say this? It was extremely busy, loud, a lot of hustle and bustle, a lot of, you know, in those days, it was people moving materials by hand on, on hand trucks or uh, racks with, you know, rolling racks. Nowadays, you have a lot of uh, conveyor belts or automated systems and stuff so we were all you know hands-on and just a lot of action i mean you had to i as i said to i take people on tours we always had to you know stand in a certain place and not walk in a certain place you'd get run over yeah. and uh it was just uh, a lot of action and a lot of noise we had uh punch presses knocking out the metal parts for the for the speed king for the cymbal stands for the hi-hats then we had the wood department saws going like mad, cutting the veneers for the shells, and uh, so I would I would just say a lot of hustle and bustle. That's awesome. I'm sure the days flew by. Oh yeah, well, and that was one of the things that I really missed when we got rid of, when we sold the company or when I was invited to leave was going in the factory. I mean, you know, no more the sounds and the smells. And I've been, the, the Damon Avenue factory was made into condominiums after Selmer moved them, moved the factory to North Carolina. And I went in there one time because a drum teacher I know lives there. That's and, funny. Oh, God, was it depressing. It was dead quiet, you know. And I thought, oh, I got to get out of here. This yeah. isn't right. This is wrong. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, great answer. Um, I got two more. We can quickly go through these. Um, This one is from a gentleman named Robert. Um, What was it like growing up in the Ludwig household? Not only just like sitting in front of the TV watching Ed Sullivan with the Beatles and it just blowing up, but were there drummers coming in and out? Were there, was it really, you know, were people playing the drums all the time? Or was it a pretty regular house? You're just doing homework? Well, it was it was a regular house to me, but looking back on it, it was wild. I mean, we had drummers coming through constantly. Uh, we had drums and timpani set up in the basement. A couple of times, bands came in their tour of us, and the whole band came into the house. Wow! Out. And Joe Morello would always he was good friends with mom and dad, and he'd come and spend the night at the house when he had a day off in Chicago and. I'd always pester him to, you know, come on, Uncle Joe, sleep in my lower bunk of my bunk bed. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he'd play drums, and I'd watch him. And uh, Buddy Rich was there a couple of times, and it was crazy. I mean, there were a lot of drummers coming through nonstop. Because drummers would come into the factory for a tour, and then after that we'd say, well, you know, why don't you come out to the house for dinner? And uh, 
you know, and that was that was the routine, and it was it was a riot. Well, speaking speaking of Joe Morello, though, one of my quick stories that just popped in my head: I was in third grade. Mom and Dad were at the you know went to the Dave Brubeck concert for about a thousand people in the audience, and we're standing on the side of the stage. I got my little shirt and tie on like I always did, and uh, all of a sudden, Joe's snare drum just sounded awful. And Dad, you know, we we noticed that the uh, snare string broke. So Dad pushes me out on stage and says, go get the drum. So I start to walk out nonchalantly to go get Joe's snare drum. He's still playing on the tom-toms. And I made the mistake of looking out at the audience, and I just froze. <laughs> and and I look back, and Joe Joe's looking at me over his glasses, smiling and going, come here, come here. So I get my courage up, get out there, get the snare drum, Take it back to the side. Dad and I fix the string real quick. Dad pushes me back out, you know, to deliver it. And this time I didn't look anywhere except right at Joe. Put the drum back on the stand, and then he continued to, to play. But wow, and I, I remember it like it was last week. That that feeling when I looked at the audience and thought, "Oh my God, there's so many people." <laughs> That's awesome. What I like is about all this is just you, you're not. You didn't take it for granted. I feel like you've enjoyed every moment of being in a drum family. Oh, yeah, absolutely. My final question would be, um, so I did an interview with uh, Jim Moritz, who is the sh uh, of the Chicago Drum Company, um, who grew up working at Slingerland. Now, right. I know there is some um, growing up, Slingerland and Ludwig were like, competitors. Obviously, they were competitors. They were, you guys were button heads. Arch, arch enemies. Arch, arch enemies. enemies. So yes. he said there was some stories about people from Ludwig would be going and looking through the dumpsters to see what Slingerland was working on. And he said, I'm sure Slingerland was doing that to the Ludwig boys. Do you have any any kind of tales of, uh, of uh, uh, deceit or deception with the Slingerland crew? Well, uh, Jim's story is partially correct, saying that someone from Ludwig <laughs> went through their dumpster. It wasn't someone from Ludwig. It was my father. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! And, and the way, yeah. And this this happened one day in high school on a Saturday. I'm in my room, and Dad comes in. And he goes, "Come on, take a ride with me." So okay, I get my shoes on, and I start to follow him out to the garage. And on the way out, I said, "Where are we going?" He goes, "We're going up to Slingerland. I'm going through the dumpster. You're going to watch for the police." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Wait a minute." I'm not having anything to do with this. And he goes, fine, I'll go by myself. And off he goes. Man. So he comes back like three hours later with a trunk load of crap he pulled out of their dumpster of cut up shells and strainers they're working on. And he's saying, look at this, look at the door. I can't believe they're working on a, on a new sear butt, you know, and I can't. <laughs> wow. And so that, that was my dad doing that. And he also would go to Slingerland and, around noontime to count how many cars were in the parking lot to estimate their employees, how many employees they had. Man. So it consumed, oh, yeah. it's consuming to the fight between, <laughs> between Slinger. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, uh, I never met Bud Slingerland, but had I, I probably would have kicked him in the balls because <laughs> that's just the way I was brought up. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're raised to hate the Slingerland family. Yes. Well, obviously, Slingerland uh, is no more. Their their trademark right. is owned by Gibson, I believe. But, um, you know, so I think Ludwig won in the end. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, Bill, I think um, I think that wraps it up. I think that's a great ending, hearing about the, the feud between Slingerland and knowing that the, yeah. uh, the disdain was even more than I, <laughs> I anticipated. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's great. Okay, well, good. Thank you, Bill. Have a great day. All right. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History, and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.